on this episode of Indiana Education Insight. Just keeping focused on students, that's what our charge is. And if we stay focused on what's best for kids, I think we will continue to do great things. Every week, the Indiana Association of Public School Superintendents is taking you inside today's Indiana education collaboration and tomorrow's education trends. We're staying on the pulse of public school innovators throughout Indiana and beyond. Join our conversation and contribute to our upcoming topics at iapssin.org slash podcast. Here's your host, Dr. J.T. Koopman. Thanks for joining us on today's episode of Indiana Education Insight. I'm Dr. J.T. Koopman, Executive Director of IAPSS. This podcast is being delivered by our IPSS team and produced by our friends at Edge Media Studios. As Executive Director of IPSS, I'm excited to bring you this weekly show where we feature Indiana education innovators from all over our great state, from students to superintendents. We'll also be talking to higher education leaders and educators at the state level as we work together as proactive public education advocates. That's why IEPSS is here and why we're proud to bring you this show. Every week, we're talking about trending topics in public education in this space while bringing in Indiana education innovators to hear from their perspective. As with any organization, it takes great leadership to be successful, and that is one of the main missions of IEPSS, developing great school district leaders. It is always great to have experienced and passionate educators joining us on the show. So let's get started the conversation today with Dr. Jennifer McCormick, the Indiana State Superintendent. Dr. McCormick, thank you for being with us. We're excited to have you with us today. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. So can you tell us a little bit uh, how you got involved with uh, public education and also how you came to be involved with politics as the (laughs) Indiana State Superintendent? So I entered into the educational world right out of high school. You know, I had interest in helping students with special needs in high school, and that kind of launched me into um, Purdue, where I majored in elementary education, and um, we so fondly called that double E, which drove the electrical engineers crazy at Purdue, but finally got through um, education at Purdue and haven't looked back since. So was a teacher and principal and superintendent and very proud of the work that I've done in education. Politics is another story. So I'm really new to this. Never ran for an office before state superintendent. He wasn't a huge politically aligned person. I really just got in the race simply to do what was best for kids. Well, having known you for quite some time as as a superintendent and as a principal, I know the outstanding work that you did in your school district. So we're absolutely thrilled to have you representing public schools as the state superintendent. So what is different about uh, today's schools and uh, why is it important for today's school leaders to understand some of the significant changes that are happening? You know, I think so many times we're up against some policies that can be difficult. And so I think for public educators to get more involved and more so now than ever in where that policy meets that practitioner um, and making sure that the practice is heard and, and we have our voice. And so that's different from what it was even when I started teaching. You know, it just I feel like we were going along and and it wasn't so contentious. And so I think being more of a voice now is more important than ever. Well, I, I agree with you, and, and having done this for quite some time, um, there's been so many changes in such a short period of time for us to keep up with as superintendents and as principals. And so um, what do you consider to be some of the key components in these changes, and how can we help Indiana superintendents be more effective in leading their school district with all of these changes? Yeah, and some of the changes have been good and some have been problematic. And so how do we balance that? And so also keeping on top of it. It's it's a lot to stay educated on what's happening and how to implement and how to do that well so students benefit. Also understanding that we're under limited resources. So that gets tricky as well. So I would just encourage superintendents to continue to be a learner, which many of them are. Uh, make sure they're asking great questions and make sure that they are a voice for their district. Um, you know, we can we can talk about education and we can talk about things that have, have, have occurred in education till the cows come home mm-hmm. because that's a great topic that you and I love to discuss. However, we just uh, com- concluded the last uh, legislative session of the General, General Assembly in 2017. Um, many of the topics that we're focused on were roads and infrastructure in the state of Indiana as well as education. So uh, what are some of the 
changes that you saw in this legislative uh, session that maybe you expected or didn't expect? Yeah, I think the budget is always tricky. And so, you know, coming out of the House, I was a little concerned because of the pay for performance monies that were were eliminated, but it came back in the end with a lesser amount. But we're very appreciative that it did come back. Um, some of the 1003, House Bill 1003 with the accountability and the assessment piece. The assessment piece will be big for all of us. And at the department, we are committed to working with the State Board of Education to make sure we get it right, making sure that we have limited testing and meet the letter of the law, but yet um, we use it for a purpose. And so making sure we get 1003 to a, to a degree that we can um, live with is going to be easier said than done. But that was one that came out of the legislative session that was big. Well, obviously, from my perspective, you did a terrific job of articulating a, a clear vision for what you wanted assessment to look like in Indiana schools. And some of that evolved and, and came to fruition in 1003, and some of it did not. Are there any particular pieces of 1003 that, that you would have preferred uh, not be there, or are there things that you would like to have seen in 1003 that we didn't see this time? So the th grade three through eight piece, you know, that flexibility with either a computer adaptive or fixed form, I think we can get that piece right. I'm very concerned about the high school with end of the course assessments. And I understand why people like end of the course assessments, but I think they're thinking of the end of the course assessments back in the good old days. And so I think it's going to be, it could be problematic. We're trying to work through how we define that. What does that look like? And the ramifications of those students who take of many of those courses at the middle level that may not be counted for the high school. So there are just some pieces. I'm just not a big end of the course assessment fan. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> we know that the principals association they had are. different feelings about that, sure. but that's okay. Yeah. Um, we were very optimistic when uh, we had a change from no child left behind to ESSA or every student succeeds. And uh, it kind of seems like that that's in flux right now. Um, is our plan going to align, our assessment plan going to align with the new ESSA plan, or is it too early to tell? So we're going to be a late submission, but we feel confident in the work. We've been across the state and re-engaged our stakeholders. That has gone well for us. Um, so we'll continue to build that plan, making sure that everybody has eyes on the review. But our goal is to take as much flexibility that we can from the federal level. Our concern is that that middle level state um, doesn't necessarily per se get in the way. So we're going to look for as much flexibility that we can. Um, the local level is asking for that. I have a lot of faith in implementation at the local level. Um, but again, we have to write a great plan, get it through at the federal level, but we also have to have it blessed by our governor. Any other uh, significant education bills that we saw introduced uh, in this session that uh, maybe we expected or didn't expect? Yeah, so the way we look at budgeting was changed in 1009, which was kind of interesting and get, uh, kind of chipped away at the silos, um, which I think um, some folks are a little bit nervous about and others welcomed. So it's kind of a split out in the field, but I think we have to live that to see how it goes for mm -hmm. us. I know I came from a district that we were having concerns with the circuit breakers for certain funds like our bus replacement. And so having that flexibility would have helped some of us, but for others, I understand the concern. Um, our CTE information that came out regarding that legislation around career technical education, I think will be good in the long run. But um, as you know and well know, you were at the table for making that bill better so that we could really move CTE forward in the state of Indiana. But I think that was promising. One of the, the uh, you brought up making bills better is we, we saw some bills that were really not very good that were introduced early in the session. And I think through your leadership and the conversations that you had with our legislators, we saw some bad bills made better. So Certainly from our perspective, we want to thank you for your leadership uh, for, for some of those issues. And uh, are there any other bills maybe that you'd want to speak to? Uh, we talked about, um, you know, the budget bill, which was 1001. We talked about assessment, which was 1003. We talked about the new uh, construction of the formula, which was 1009. Uh, any other bills you'd like to comment on? You know, on? The, the course assessment bill, uh, there's a lot of chatter in the field about that right now. We're trying to muddle our way through that so that the implementation is clear of the expectations of the bill. So that's been done in other states that we've talked about. And I think watching what they've and learned from the mistakes they've made and the successes in other states. But that is one as far as making sure students still have opportunity because that's a goal for all of us. Sure. But yet we have some um, some in the weeds type of issues to work out with that bill. 
will. So, but that will be interesting on how that rolls out. The other one is the seclusion and restraint that kind of snuck up on us, and that'll right. impact those who have school resource officers. Right. Um, we will also be providing further guidance on not just reporting, but best practice so that schools can really um, make some really good decisions. Okay, well, great. So, um, you know, this is your first experience by being a state superintendent mm-hmm. with the General Assembly. Are you seeing any any trends or anything evolving as a result of your relationship with the legislature this time? I will commend them. You know, they all the legislators worked well with us. They came to the table. They asked great questions. In the end, we, we didn't always agree and we agreed to disagree, but at least they're asking questions, tried to educate themselves. So we appreciate that, that at least we're, our voice is being heard. We're going to be smarter going into the next legislative session and get out in front of it to make sure that we are proactive for some of the policies that may be coming at us versus we were very reactive this year, given the timing. Right. So we're making our list of um, items that we would like to see and try to get a legislative later to carry those bills for us as well, some of those topics, and um, we're working on that as we speak, but um, we'll approach the next session more aggressively. Well, I thought you did a great job in in this particular session, especially since you were seated after the General Assembly got started, so (laughs) it was interesting. you truly were behind the eight ball Mm -hmm. uh, in many ways, and from our perspective as an association, uh, we would like to work with the department starting, you know, in August or whenever you choose to do so, because we do feel the same that, that uh, the a lot of the work happens before the session begins. And so having those conversations with legislators in the fall before it starts in January, I think is a, a key element for those conversations to happen. Anything going on in summer study committee that uh, you'd like to comment on? Well, we'll wait and see what comes to um, what actually is ha- going to happen in summer study committees. So there are a couple of things that we're keeping an eye on, but until we know exactly what's going to be assigned to study committee, um, we'll just kind of wait and see how that plays out. There are a couple of things. The decoupling is one example um, from the ISEP or ILEARN to the teacher evaluation. Um, that's going to maybe go to study committee. So we'll we'll wait and see what what's there and be a voice in those items that we need to comment on. How about preschool? Uh, You know, we had a bill that was introduced uh, to expand preschool, and that kind of went back and forth for quite some time. Uh, How will the additional counties be determined, and when will that uh, announcement be made on the additional counties for preschool? You know, we won't, the department won't have any um, insight into that, so that's a great question that I don't have the answer to, but as far as the preschool expansion, we were pleased to see that expand out counties, so we were glad to see more touches across the state. We're also glad to see the expansion. It's, I don't think any of us are going to be happy until it's universal and we have what we need for those who are most at risk, but I also understand the financial piece, and so, um, but as far as when the counties and the announcements, now our partners with FSSA, um, we've been in good communication with them, and they told us they would let us know so we can communicate to the field some of those time um, factors that people are kind of waiting on. Well, the, uh, what they refer to as the pass to quality that make a determination on, on high-quality preschool, will that also be part of the equation for those counties? I believe so, but we're just – those are great questions. We'll have to wait and see what the answers are. But I'm assuming since that was a precursor to the last selection, sure. so I'm assuming that will continue. Okay. Well, great. So uh, lots of trends and lots of things happening by way of, of some of this legislative session. So uh, if you had to take a look into your crystal ball, are there any things out there that we should be leery of or that we should be uh, happy about the, that's coming down the path for public education? You know, we're just watching what went through this session to see what may come back um, that may tighten up. So we're always keeping our eye on that just based on some conversations that we heard. We're also, again, we're going to be proactive this summer, get to a lot of the policy conference at the national level that many of our legislators are attending so we can hear the same conversations they're hearing and look at the context in which they're hearing it. So nothing really pinpointed right now per se, but we're keeping our eye on it. We will be prepared. Okay. Well, part of the uh, the conversation that we've heard about is that, um, you know, we've heard great things that are happening in our public schools across the state of Indiana. You've done a terrific job of highlighting many of those things. And quite honestly, that's one of the reasons that we're doing this podcast is to highlight all of the positive aspects of public education in our state. However, we also have a teacher shortage out there. And so one of the things that we would like to do is talk about the great things that are handing and happening, excuse me, happening in Indiana public schools. And so 
Uh, how can we do a better job of messaging and how can we encourage uh, young people to get into education? So at the department, for the first time, we have a chief talent officer, Dr. Scott Syverson, who was an administrator in, in, in Indiana before he moved out of that role, and he is now at the department, and he has done a great job of keeping his eyes on that. So we, ha we felt like we needed someone who was assigned to specifically that issue. So we're looking at how do you message it through marketing, and then how do you share those resources with the local level, but also, too, how do you um, have the conversation regarding what is actually having folks leave the field? And so there's a lot of chatter regarding is it money is it not money is it benefits is, is it not is it the working condition only is it not we are doing at best because we don't have a lot of that data coming from our local levels that I think we could do very easily so that we could hand that to our legislators and say here are the top reasons why we're losing folks right. to better tackle some of that so just being very purposeful in what we're doing looking at a marketing strategy which we are having a lot of conversations with traditional and non-traditional <laughs> folks who can help us get more people into the field of quality, not just quantity. Um, but a lot of, um, it's very busy in that arena right now at the department. Well, I think that Scott will do a wonderful job with that. And it sounds like to me, you have a good plan laid out. So I appreciate that on behalf of all of our future educators. I happened to uh, be in a session at, at Ball State here recently, and they kind of laid out what enrollment looked like. Mm -hmm. And I was encouraged to see that we're having more students enrolled in uh, education preparation than we've had in the last three years. So that gave me some encouragement. Of course, I have no idea what's happening at other universities, but Ball State, it appears that their, their enrollment is going up. So I was happy to hear about yeah, that. Yeah, so we've been meeting with the deans of many of the colleges of ed and were participants in the commencement for Ball State and Purdue, which was quite an honor, but just listening to their concerns, but they are optimistic. So I think there is a, a trend that I think people are starting to see more hope in that arena, but we have some work to do. Okay, well, great. Yeah. So in closing, uh, do you have any advice for our current or future educators in the state of Indiana? You know, it's just, it's a tough job. It's complex. It's difficult. But boy, as you well know, it's one of the most rewarding jobs that one can have. And so our careers, but just keeping focused on students, that's what our charge is. And if we stay focused on what's best for kids, I think we will continue to do great things. I absolutely agree with you. Staying focused on what's best for kids in the state of Indiana. I'd like to thank our guest, Dr. Jennifer McCormick, for being with us on today's edition of Indiana Education Insight. We appreciate her comments and for her to be here with us today. Thank you, Dr. McCormick. Thank you. Now it's time to wrap up this episode with my take on the current state of affairs in Indiana education landscape. Dr. JT's closing comments. And unfortunately, even though we have so much research about the high quality of schools, much of this research has been dismissed by our legislators. And the same appears to be true with the new Trump administration and the Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos. As we make headway uh, with the revisions of No Child Left Behind and the rewriting, rewriting of ESSA, this administration appears to want to dismantle it in favor of charter schools and vouchers along with billions of dollars in reductions in the title programs aimed at helping disadvantaged youth and families. When asked how we plan to help these kids and their families, the reply was, can you help us make cuts of $9 billion in wasted public money going to our public schools? We had a chance to get it right, but we missed a golden opportunity. Perhaps we can pursue this issue and others in another segment of Indiana Education Insight. Our next show, we will welcome Dr. Ken Folks, superintendent of the East Allen Community Schools and a panel uh, member of the Indiana Assessment Committee. Perhaps Dr. Folks can provide some additional insight into the State House and education. Join us for that and more on the next at Insight into Indiana Education. And thanks for being part of education. Please stand up for Indiana Public Schools. <music>